Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom. I say Shabbat shalom. shabbat shalom. Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Are you glad to be here today? Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. We're glad to be here. We want to say welcome to Simchat Yeshua. We're so glad that you have come today. And we say Baruchim Habaim to all of our first time guests. And especially to those that are watching online today on Facebook Live. Let's give it up for those that are watching. On Facebook Live, all over the world, people are tuning in and watching. They'll be watching all week long, getting this message. We have a special, special treat for you today. Uh, we are starting a new series called Dress for Service. What are we talking about? Dress, Dress for, for service. service. And our special Torah uh, tag team today will be between our Hazan, Mordecai, or Martin Coronado, and myself. And we are talking about a message called From Rags to Riches. Uh, excuse me, not rags to riches, from rags to righteousness. <laughs> That's what I had in mind when I thought of the title. From rags to righteousness, all right? So we're excited about that today, and so we're going to go ahead and start with some mosaic instruction. And uh, for those that are watching online, you can watch online and look at the verses. We'll be reading from the Tree of Life version. And so our first drosh today, or teaching today, comes from our cantor, Mordecai. Give it up for Mordecai today. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom, Boker Tov, how are we all doing today? Shabbat Shalom. Well, in today's portion, I'm actually going to be uh, focusing a little bit more on Vaik Hill, which is where we understand the whole concept of uh, uh, Moses assembling. But it's, it takes a thing a little more of a twist when you really start to consider all the understandings and all the information that you read in the Torah. And I'd like to start off with, you know, the, one of the great things that we have to always look at is a new opening for a new establishment. You're talking a new restaurant, new store, new this, new that. Guess what? People like to go to it. Let's check it out. Let's see what it's all about. And with that also com comes new management. And at the time, you know, when you start to look at how a new place is, you also find out, oh, yeah, this is my place or this is not my place, okay? I don't like their food. I don't like how they do this kind of service for me. I don't like, no. That's how you find out eventually whether that's a place that you always speak about, or that you will always be able to uh, uh, patronize. Uh, rather, you go over there to that place. But I would like to get into Exodus chapter 35, verses 1 through 9. And we have to understand first the offerings that were expected, that were asked from God to Moses. <laughs> and Scripture says here that Moses assembled all the congregation of B'nai Israel and said to them, which are... The word, uh, these are the words of Adonai that has commanded to you. Work is to be done in six days, but the seventh day is holy, is a holy day for you. A Shabbat of complete rest to Adonai. Whoever does any work will die. Do not kindle a fire in any of your dwellings on Yom, uh, Yom Shabbat. Verse 4. Moses also said to all the congregation of B'nai Israel, the sons of Israel, the children of Israel, this is the word which Adonai commanded, saying, Take from among you an offering for Adonai. Whoever has a willing heart, let him bring Adonai's offering. Gold, silver, bronze, or copper in some, uh, uh, in some uh, versions. Blue, purple, and scarlet cloth. Fine linen and goat hair. Ram skins dyed red. Seal skins and acacia wood. Oil for the light. Spices for the anointing oil. And for the sweet incense. Onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breastplate. Now, keep in mind, the people have already, been, have already left Egypt, and they were also taken out of the house of bondage. So, one of the first things you have to understand is, God has been already bringing them together in different places, from Goshen to Mount Sinai, and now here, at this place where we are gathering all the items necessary for the building of a tabernacle. That's one of the first things we've got to look at. Number two is that in verse 2, Shabbat. For over 400 years, the children of Israel were forced and for, uh, were in forced labor working every day. Now they are free from the Pharaoh's oppression, and they can rest from their labor and rest on God. Even restrictions were set in place concerning the Mishkan, the tabernacle. So you are now having the people not only just get to know, get to learn to become one and be gathered into God, but also learning what rest is. Again, you're, you're working from day and night, to, uh, every day, to now being able to say, working six days a week and having Shabbat off. This right there will be a, a constant reminder for them, hey, you know what? We're worshiping God. And remember what God kept telling Moses to tell Pharaoh, they're going to go out to the desert and worship me. Well, 
promises, fulfillment. Now, verses 5, 4 and 5, they are commanded to give God a portion. From where? From what was given to them by the Egyptians. So, remember, when they left, the, uh, they, they left uh, Egypt, they were commanded, hey, go, go to the houses and ask the people, hey, uh, you have any gold that you can give us and whatnot? Guess what? They pretty much pulled the, the slot lever, and out comes all the riches that, that was stored up, uh, that, that was going to be given for the righteous was stored up by the wicked. Now, they all had it. All of this was accounted for. And that also kind of ties in with, uh, with uh, Pekude because that's one of the understandings, which is accounting. Not counted, but accounted for. Accounting shows relationships. You see where it's been, what it does, the condition. All of the material for the construction of the tabernacle, much like an inadvertent sins and transgressions were committed and recorded as an example. And then looking at that, that those are the accounts. That's how people knew, especially with the, uh, with, uh, the priesthood, that there's an accounting done. Hey, this person has committed this inadvertent sin. Okay, now we're going to deal with it. The understanding really comes down to this. And have them make a sanctuary for me. Uh, the accounting shows relationships. And you see where it's been? Now, the biggie is the material used, the gold which represented eternity, silver represented redemption, and copper, bronze, also represents judgment. So you start to really look at where God is bringing together all these things for the Mishkan, which you look, you look at the uh, inner workings of the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the, and the, uh, and the, the I'm trying to remember the, the three spots in which the gold was used, which would always make us look forward to eternity. The hooks that were being used, though, the rings, were made out of silver. You think about that for us. We're all joined by the redemption in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen? That silver is what we were to look at when we understand what is being brought before us. The children of Israel would be able to look at the building of, of the Mishkan at the tabernacle and be able to then study more and let us sink in more of what God was doing to them. Again, have them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. And maybe in some respects you can even look at that as saying that I may dwell in them. I'd like to go with the prophetic understandings in 2 Kings 22, verse 3 to, uh, to 6 in the Tree of Life version. And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan son of Azaliah, son of Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of Adonai, saying, Go up to Hil uh, Hilkiah, Hilkiah, the Kohen Gadol, and let him weigh the silver that has been brought to the house of Adonai, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people. Then let them give it into the hand of the workmen, appointed to oversee the work, on the house of Adonai, and let them, and let, and let them in turn give it to the workmen that are in the house of Adonai to repair the damages to the house, to the carpenters, the builders, and masons, and for buying timber and cut stone to repair the house. You notice that now there is a... You, I go with him, even though I actually use this. As a matter of fact, I'm also going to go with uh, Second Chronicles, which I used last week. But this actually was very important because we see that Josiah is repairing the temple. In the reparation, as I really read this and I started realizing this, you start to see the, the line of events that, that start to occur. The people. From there, the book comes out. Shaphan reads it to King Josiah. He is moved. He seeks now inquiry of the prophet uh, of, of the Lord. And hence the words come from the prophet is Hulda, telling him this is what's going to happen. From there, the Reformation. He wants to clean house. And if you think about that, the temple, when it moves, if you look at the people, it was supposed to be where the people can come back together. You see, when you actually start working on a place, when you start to clean it up, people will now actually see importance to it. When you let it just fall apart, nobody will care. Let me tell you something. I've gone to the Temple Mount 10 years ago, and I'm going to tell you that, guess what? That Dome of the Rock has a bunch of bullet holes. What are they really saying? We don't care about this spot. It's just an issue. It's not something that they want to fix. On the other hand, 
Other places, they keep fixing it up around the hotel, the bridge. They always want to make repairs to keep the place in check, make it, make it all work. There's no dangers for anybody. And in doing that, they're really showing we care about what we have. We are the ones who give, this, who give those things that God has given to us, to us the, the, the importance. Sadly, we can also have the ability to diminish if we are not careful. If I don't care about this place, I'm going to, I'm really going to say, yeah, this place, let it diminish, let it fall apart. God doesn't fall apart, but keep that in mind. But you know what? He, does, he will not be seen through me. You will not see God through me because I am so proud or so arrogant. You understand? Now, when we care for what God has wanted to build, he will send more responsibilities for our growth. Think about that. You think, oh, okay, well, we already got past this. No. It's time to still grow up some more. He doesn't want you to become stagnant. You're becoming a house. Because if you think about it, the tabernacle wasn't just only the traveling tent, if you will. Eventually, it became a stationary building. They wanted to make it so ornate to honor God. Yes, sadly, David wanted to build it. But it was not him, but his son Shlomo, Solomon, who would build it eventually. Second Chronicles also speaks of Josiah in the case of Passover. Josiah celebrated Passover, and this is from chapter 25, verse 1 to 3. He celebrated Passover unto Adonai in Jerusalem. They slaughtered the Passover lamb on the 14th day of the first month, which is Nisan, or Aviv, in the, uh, before. He reinstated the Kohanim to their duties and encouraged them in the service of the house of Adonai. He said to the Levites, who taught all Israel, and who were consecrated to Adonai, put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of King David of Israel, built. Since it is no longer a burden on your shoulders now, serve Adonai, your God, and his people. Now I want you to really look at this, and this is, I think, extremely important. We, are, we make the connection with Exodus. What was introduced in Exodus? Passover. When you commit an act of idolatry, when, pe when in this case the children of Israel commit the acts of idolatry, they come down. And think about it in this way. Israel is up here. Egypt geographically is down here. So what did God want to show us? Why are you going down? He's trying to say, hey, go up. I redeemed you. If you look at that again, that's the third cup, if you will, but it's also the third word that is used, I redeemed you. So he's trying to put all this together. And in, in, with Passover, the perfect way of showing all to the children of Israel, this is what God did for us. When he took us out, he rescued us, he redeemed us, and now he's taking us for himself. Amen? Amen. That is the understanding of how even the people also make a connection. The people themselves, if you will, also like a way of uh, using, as an example, the tabernacle. Because we are actually fashioned together. What your job is, is your, your job. Whether it's just even a tent peg. A tent peg is very important. You might think, I got a small menial job. So what? It's still important. That's all that truly matters. I'm going to say this because, I, and I'm glad that Rabbi has said it, that God doesn't love us equally. He loves us uniquely. You are who you are. Amen. I am who I am. And there's moments when, I don't know about you, but when, like, uh, Sister, uh, Sister Maria, she had said that, that's, that that little voice, well, guess what? That little voice also hits me, but it's him ministering to me. What he does for me, he will not do for you, but I can guarantee you he will still minister to you. Amen? All right, now let's go from there, from the fact that the, the, uh, the, uh, the priesthood is now ministering unto the children of Israel. And Josiah did a course correction with Israel. And that's after listening to the words of the prophets hold up. He celebrated the Passover, Pesach, and was to bring up Israel from the, the idolatry. And this gathering helps to understand Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will rejoice greatly in Adonai. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me in a robe of righteousness, like a bridegroom wearing a priestly turban, like a bride adorning herself with, with her jewels. 
And this is actually an awesome song called Sosa Sis, and that's actually in Hebrew, uh, speaking about this. You've got to look at is just as we are being dressed up, the priesthood inside, they're the ones who are directing us. We look at them. Man, they look gorgeous. You talk about dressed to the nines? No, they're dressed to the 90s, okay? They're just showing the, the, the glory that God has placed upon them. In their learning and in their keeping with the Torah and with their expectation of the Messiah, even if he wasn't there, guess what? Nonetheless, they're expecting towards the Messiah. They are dressed with those, the big day yesha, which is the garments of salvation. And guess what? They go out for the world to see. They go out for the world to see them. How can the world be reached if we don't have those same garments of salvation in our lives? If we're not robed with righteousness? Yeah, not everyone is going to answer. But you know what? There's people who will still answer. God will send you to whoever to pull from, the, from that lake. When you cast that net out, he will provide, even if it's one fish, guess what? It's still one fish. I want to do now the understanding for the Brich Hadashah from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. When I saw that number, I thought, oh, gee, I didn't know that there was a place out in San Diego County. Okay? 619, area code. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Again, the, the focusing on idolatry, but also even as to what we do with ourselves, or don't you know that your body is a temple of the Ruach HaKodesh who is in you? whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. Amen? Amen. You think about that. This, the establishment of the tabernacle, which eventually went in to become the temple, was really focused for ourselves. Because how we treat that, we will treat ourselves. You think you're cheap, you'll do things that are cheap. But you really put yourself in an honest way of importance. You know, no, I do mean something. Guess what? You will now start directing your, your life, your footsteps, all according to God. It's sometimes some of the toughest things because we have to deal with a lot of issues in our lives. But I want you guys to gather this thought. Stay upon the Lord. Have your mind stayed upon the Lord. Amen? You keep yourself with that trust in Him just as the priest, the high priest, will be doing it, especially on Yom Kippur when he goes, one on, when he goes by himself into the Holy of Holies. And let's also look at 1 Peter 2, verse 5, from the Tree of Life version. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Messiah Yeshua. Brethren, that's what we're supposed to be, united. All those things that were being done, it's either covering or a connection. There's people here who have a beautiful spirit, and they are, if you will, those nice, uh, the nice uh, coverings on the outside of the tabernacle. And guess what? Those are the same people who have that same spirit. And people say, you know what? I want to talk to that person. Then there's, of course, the stilts. And those, those, those of us, if you will, who are like the stilts that hold up those, uh, those tapestries. When we do that, we're also trying to hold up, hey, guys, let's have structure. But they both work together. They work in conjunction. They don't work against each other. Amen. And it goes on into the temple itself, or rather the tabernacle, eventually the temple. But all of us to lead us to always remind us of the goal. Eternity. Rabbi, I'm getting beat. Oh no, and the hot tag is coming in. Thank you, Mordecai. You know, as we were coming together with the ideas of what this new series would look like, it's funny because I wanted to start in Leviticus and I really felt like I had to start at the end of Exodus. And that's because, really, we start talking about the garments of the priesthood and their role going into Leviticus. So we were sitting around just, I think it was just last week, and mm -hmm. Rabbi Eric said, how about we call it Dress for Service? Mm -hmm. I said, I like that, Dress for Service. And I was thinking about the fact that Many times we talk about the tabernacle, but we forget to talk about what is required to minister in the tabernacle. 
Amen. We talk about the temple, but we forget the requirement of the priesthood to be temple priests of God. And if you and I are going to be kings and priests unto God, we need to follow the model that's been set before us and understand all of these physical garments that the priest would wear and the high priest would be adorned with actually are a picture of what you and I spiritually adorn ourselves with. Yeah. That there's a spiritual priesthood who offers up spiritual sacrifices. One of the last verses that was referenced by Mordechai, uh, which is Mark Pornado, our, our elder and a cantor. We, we absolutely see that the holy place had a purpose. How many know God's holy places that we come to worship in have a purpose? Amen. The question is, have we dressed ourselves with the same purpose as the place that we worship in? Yes. Have we put on those garments of praise for the spirit of heaven? Have we put on the spiritual garments that we need to put on, even the armor of God when we're going into battle? Every king had to be a conqueror, and every priest uh, was given the opportunity, if they were a son of Aaron, to maybe one day fill the shoes of the high priest. You and I need to be clothed with Messiah because he is our high priest. So today what I'd like to do is I want to tag this idea that Martin gave us about the need for a holy place, a sanctuary, whether that was the tabernacle or the temple, and show the holy place had to have people that ministered in holy garments. Because I believe today you and I need to take off those old garments and we need to put on holy garments when we come to the house of a holy God. Amen. That doesn't mean perfectionism. That doesn't mean that you and I won't fail. That doesn't mean that sometimes we don't experience grief or sadness or sorrow. What it means is we have an opportunity to put something else on and take something off. Yes. You and I have the ability with the free will that God gave us to take off certain things that we wear on our faces, wear with our attitudes, wear with our actions, wear with our demeanor, and put on things that can change the atmosphere that we step into. Amen. How many know we are atmosphere changers? We have the ability to, to worship God like with incense that makes you smell good after you pray with that kind of incense. And worship God in the beauty of holiness. You and I have that ability. We change the atmosphere that we live in and our houses that we dwell in when we bring in the presence of God. Amen. So to do that, I want to say to two things of uh, verses that he brought up. And one, that God wants to dwell among his people in a sanctuary. He talked about the holy place, the sanctuary. Exodus 25, 8, have them make me a what? Well, a sanctuary well. for me. This is not for me. This is not for you. This is for who? Amen. It's for God. We built this place for God. Amen. We're building him a holy place that he can dwell in. But I love the fact that he says, I don't want to just dwell in the place. I want to de dwell in a place where my presence can dwell, which is you. Amen. Notice this. So that I may dwell among them. The actual Hebrew says in them. Amen. In their innermost being is literally what God says. I want to dwell in that place so I can show them how I can dwell in this place. Yeah. So that that tabernacle becomes this tabernacle. And that temple becomes a temple for the Holy Spirit to dwell. Amen. And how we know that is from one of the, the second to last verse he gave us. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh? The Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. So in the way I dwelt the tabernacle, the way I indwelt the temple, that is the way I indwell your body as a tabernacle, and your dwelling place, your temple as a place for the Holy Spirit to abide. Amen. How many have the Holy Spirit abiding them as a believer in Messiah? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up in Exodus 35, the beginning of our portion of Abayakel, which means to assemble, which is, uh, starts with Exodus 35, 1. But I'm going to jump to verse 19. And it says in verse 19, The woven garments for ministering in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the Kohen, and for his sons to minister as Kohenim. I'm kind of picking up on a thought here. This is what Israel brought to God. And this is what Israel prepared for God that the priest could have garments that were woven for ministering in the holy place. So Martin established the need for a holy place. Now I'm going to establish the need for holy garments Amen. for the holy place. Amen. That we can't come into a holy place with rags. We've got to come in with robes of righteousness. We've got to come in with garments of praise. Amen? Amen. The holy garments, how, what kind of garments? Holy, holy garments. These are big, uh, big day Kodesh. 
Bideha Kodesh, which means clothing. The word Beged. Say Beged. Beged means clothing, a piece of clothing. Begedim are clothes, and bide means clothes of hakodesh, holiness. And so we see here that these are holy garments. These garments somehow represent or have the essence of or embody holiness. Holiness. This is a beautiful thing because we worship in the beauty of what? Holiness. Wait till I show you what that verse really means. I have read that concept a million times about worship God in the beauty of holiness. Yeah. And I always thought it was more the aroma yeah. of worship that was in the room. I'm going to show you it's not something in the room, it's something you wear. Mm. Watch. It says, it's for who? Aaron the Kohen, which is the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, and for his sons, because after Aaron dies, who steps in? So. An eligible son that can also carry the same weight. Now, all priests wore four pieces of garments, that were actually white linen. They had the head covering, where we get the kippah or the yarmulke, the, the idea of a skull cap or a head covering to cover the head, a turban. They also had undergarments underneath their clothing. They had to have a, a white uh, robe to cover them, and then a white sash to go around their waist. So they had four pieces of garment. The garments for the high priest were double that. From four, you go to eight. They had special garments that I won't be able to cover all today, but uh, give me about two weeks and we're going to cover the details and the symbolism behind all the colors of the blue, the purple, the scarlet, the white linen, and the gold in threaded through all of it. Oh man, we're even going to talk about the onyx stones and what they symbolize. We're going to talk about the stones of the breastplate. We're going to talk about the names that are on the breastplate. We're going to talk about the engravings of the signet like a signet ring. It's going to be amazing to see that that's transferred to what you and I wear. Amen. Spiritually, we get to wear this spiritual dynamic of clothing. And uh, if we jump over to the next verse, we see we have Exodus 35, 19, we just read from. Now let's take a look at verse 21. It says, Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit was willing came and brought Adonai's offering for the work of the tent of meeting, and for all its service, as well as for the holy garments. So guess what we've been doing when we've been dressing the Torah, and we've been purchasing a new Torah, and we've been crowning the Torah. The same way we dress the Torah is the same way the priests were dressed. That blue represents the blue ephod. The crown, the crown that said holiness unto the Lord. All of the vessels of the tabernacle and the temple represent elements of spiritual dynamics yes. in our life. And when we see that these garments were for the service, we're dressed for what? Service. service. We're dressed for what? Service. service. Not just ordinary service. It's not like service in your car. I'm talking about divine service. Uh, you might get a spiritual tune-up, though, in this divine service. You might get an oil change in this divine service. You might even get a good old car wash in this divine service. But when you come out sounding like uh, that engine is just smooth, I mean, it's like... Like butter. I mean, just like butter. I mean, just, you know, smooth. That engine cherry out is just gorgeous. I mean, I mean the, the paint, the enamel on that thing, the paint is better than the best nail polish, ladies, on your fingernails. It is something to be beautified because God wants us to, to represent his beauty, his glory, his honor. We represent him. And this is so beautiful to me that God gave me the privilege and the right to serve him. See, I was a slave in Egypt, but now I get to serve my God in divine service of avodah. Say avodah. That's a Hebrew word for work or worship or service unto God. So now, let's see where it transfers into Exodus 39.1 that talks about the holy garments. And the subtitle says, Holy Garments for Aaron and His Sons. It says, Next they made woven garments. Now here's the offering that was given by Israel. Now they're going to actually make the garments. It says, Woven garments of blue, purple, scarlet for ministering in the holy place. They made the holy garments for who? Aaron. As commanded Moses. Because remember, the priest did not wear any color but white unless they were the high priest. That's a special office. And it says uh, in verse 41, as well as the woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary, the holy garments for Aaron 
the Kohen, and for his sons to serve as Kohenim. So first you have the priestly garments, and then you have the general white garments that are going to be worn by everybody, white linen. I mean, they must have been on Miami Beach. I mean, this is white linen. This is like <laughs> a very common color among uh, those that live in uh, Florida. Now, no, this is important when you think of uh, verse chapter 40, verse 13. It says, what's the purpose? It says, you need to put the holy garments on. Turn to your neighbor and say, put it on. Put it on. Turn to somebody else who's paying attention and say, put it, put it on. Those watching online, put it on. How many of you can't put on something until you take off something? So we need to put on. See, as the priests would wash themselves and wash their clothes, they took off the old dirty garments and they put on. Say, put on. Put on. They put on new clean garments. And they would wash these garments and their bodies before they went into the holy place. You can't go into a, a holy place dirty. Amen. That's an oxymoron. It's the opposite of holy. That's right. Holiness means cleanliness before God. That's right. You know, boy, it sounds like an old saying, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> cleanliness is next to godliness, my grandmother used to say. And my mother repeated it. It's not actually in the Bible, but it's kind of a biblical principle to a degree. It is. Really okay. is. Now watch what it says. It says, the reason for these garments is that you're going to anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as Cohen. You know, I'm always leery of people that want to jump into ministry too soon. Because I believe you have to be appointed and anointed by somebody who's already anointed. And if you've gotten defiled or dirty, then you need to go to someone else that has the appointment and the anointment in their life, the anointing of God in their life, to actually reconsecrate you back to God. That doesn't mean you can't get forgiveness. What that means is you need hands freshly laid upon you. And the congregation to see that that sin is gone, those old rags are gone, and you have submitted to leadership because you can't be have authority until you're under authority. Amen. Come on, you can't be on a mission until you have submission. You've got to be under the mission. Like a submarine goes under the water, you've got to be under that mission. You've got to be under the mission of Yeshua to have the great commission because we have to co-labor in this mission with God. And we need to understand that if we're going to be anointed, then we need to be consecrated to God. Yes. That means you might have to fast. You might have to pray. You might have to do a Daniel. You might have to do a, a water fast. You might have to do no food or water. You might have to do 40 day, 21 day, 7 day, 1 day, half day. You might have to do something. I don't care if you start with just social media. Start somewhere. I don't care if you start there, just don't finish there. Because a real fast, guess what? A real fast requires you to refrain from a lot of stuff that normally gets you off focus. I'm telling you, when I have too many carbs, I go right into carb coma. <laughs> So guess what? Most of the time I do my best Bible reading when I'm hungry. Because I'm hungry physically, I'm hungry spiritually. Now a little tea or coffee does kind of make it all go down a little better. But let me tell you, before I start piling in the carbs, I want to pile in the word of God. If I'm going to have a carb today, give me the bread of life. Give me the bread that came from heaven, the manna. Give me the word of God first thing in the morning before I stuff my face. Let me stuff my spirit. Amen. you got to get your spirit man fed. We have believers that are anemic spiritually because they're not feeding their spirit man the way they feed their body. They're more committed to the things of this world than the things of the word. Amen. You know the only difference between the word world and word is the L. Because the only thing in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and that lust called the pride of life. Yes. And when we have those three lusts in our life, we don't get into the word. You know what? Lust is the, really the opposite of love. Yeah. That's right. You can't love someone you're lusting after. Because really lust means you lack love. Like lacking luster. You know, when you think about that, most relationships are lacking a little luster because they're lacking love. They have lust, but they don't have love. See, lust can be just physical, but love is spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical, all wrapped up in one package called Ahava. And when you love somebody, even if there's a physical disconnect from that person, you still love them, and distance doesn't keep you from loving them. Because true love is timeless. True love is measureless. True love is limitless. And how many know when we love God with all our heart, soul, and strength, it's easier to love our neighbor, our spouse, our coworker, our enemy. Come on, we can love everybody. When we're in the house of God and wearing the right garments, but you come in wearing anger, and you come in wearing unforgiveness, and you come in wearing bitterness, and the Bible says put off all those things. And it says, don't put on evil speaking or clamor either. You know, people have a lot of clamor. They've got a lot to say. And we do more talking to people than we talk to God. In fact, maybe the one reason for fasting Facebook 
is to get our face out of Facebook and our face into the book. Because when I fast, I'm refraining from physical food so I can actually enjoy the spiritual food of the manna of God's word. I'll eat later, maybe. Because let me tell you, there's been times where I've been so into the word, I forgot to eat. My mom would be calling me when I was a youngster. Hey, honey, you need to come in and eat your, eat your dinner. Come on, dinner's waiting. Hey, it's getting cold. Okay, mom, I'll be there in a minute. I'm reading right now. I'm praying. And I'd be praying and reading and praying and reading. I'd pray where I should read, and I'd read where I should pray. And let me tell you what would happen. I would start uh, praying for what to read, and then I would start reading my words in prayer. And then I would start praying the word. And when I start praying the word, how many know all of a sudden those two dynamic duels of prayer and the word begin to change the atmosphere around you? Because you start putting on a spiritual adornment of what God says about you instead of what the world has said about you. Take off those old garments. Tell your neighbor, take it off. Tell them, get consecrated. Come on, say, receive the anointing. You know what? You do not put oil on dirty bodies because you're going to smell like some French person. That, you know, you know I, I have to give this a little disclaimer. The French are beautiful people. But I remember my grandmother. My grandma, when she would get mad, uh, and you didn't bathe, she'd say something like, you know, put cologne on his dirty body. She'd say, you're going to smell like a French whore. Now, this used to be so, like, as a kid, I'm like, what does she mean? Well, sometimes prostitutes would go from chamber to chamber, person to person, and they would just spray on some, you know, big powder puff, spray on some perfume, thinking that perfume's going to camouflage the stench of not only their body, but every body they slept with. Guess what? You can't keep just sinning and sinning and sinning and not repenting, repenting, repenting and washing and washing and washing so that the fresh oil and fragrance of God's presence can come upon you. Because you maybe you, you fell and you sinned, you messed up, but it's time to wash yourself so the oil can come upon you and there's no stench. There's no fly in the apothecary of your anointing oil. You don't want to fly messing up your oil. You want to make sure that the smell on you, the clothing on you, represents the God you serve. Amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> no, this doesn't mean that this message is just for you. This message is for me. Because let me tell you, every time I get ready on Shabbat morning or, or if I'm a, in, a, in a congregation where people are worshiping on any given day of the week, guess what? i got to check my attitude first. If I come in saying, oh gosh, you know, here's that so-and-so again. You know, they're coming for prayer. Oh God, here comes so-and-so. They're going to complain about their problems. Oh no, here, oh here's, you know, here's uh, Brother Doodad and, and you know, D, you know, you know and, and, and Sister Bucket Mouth. She, here she comes again. And, you know, all of a sudden, my attitude's worse than theirs. I'm complaining about them not coming in the house of God, you know, seeking the Lord, but seeking man. But what about me? I have more eyes on man than on God. Instead of God giving me a revelation of God, what do you want to do in that person's life? There's been times where I, I humbled myself when the person was on their way coming. I was like, oh, not again. We're going to talk about the same problem we've talked about for a year. And every time I give them the, uh, the solution I have for them, you know, guess what? All of a sudden, you know, the, they're going to come with the same problem. And you know what? The Lord would check me. And all of a sudden, I would have the boldness to say something maybe in previous times I'd never said to them. But I said, you know what? I told this one gentleman, I said, there's nothing new I can tell you. I'm telling you right now, there's nothing new. In fact, there's nothing you, new you can tell me. I know the situation you're coming with. But if you really want to change, and I began yes. to give him a list of the things that he needed to change in his life, and he began to break down and cry and say, thank you, Rabbi, I needed you to say that. I'm like, wait a minute, you've been waiting for me to almost tell you off? You know, sometimes we get raised with, you know, a certain kind of parenting, and we think that the house of God is supposed to be like... You know, you shouldn't have to get a smackdown in the house of God. You should willingly submit to the answer. You should throw your hands up and say, God, search me, oh God. See if there's any wicked way in me. Don't let a prophet of God have to reveal it. Don't let a minister of God have to point it out. Don't let somebody's sermon have to point out my misgivings. Let me tell you, when we are submitted in prayer in the presence of God, God says, take that stuff off, put this on, and we walk out not condemned, but confirmed and consecrated for what God has for our life. You don't need me to tell you. You need God to tell you. Because all I can be is a confirmation. All I can be is a confirmation. All right, I'm going to move on because I'm going to show you something out of the prophets. Yeshua, Yahu, Isaiah 52, verse 1. Manavu, in Hebrew, the song of salvation. It says, awake, awake, clothe yourselves in your strength, Zion. Notice it's your strength. God gave it to you. Clothe yourself in beautiful what? Garments, Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean will never invade you again. What that meant was, 
when the Gentile would come in, the Gentile nations, and defile and sack Jerusalem, the temple would be destroyed and all the holy garments burned and destroyed and all the vessels tarnished, burned and destroyed and defiled, just like in the Hanukkah story, the three years prior when they had to deal with Antiochus Epiphanes and actually rededicate the temple because it had been defiled and they had to take the ashes of the red heifer and cleanse it all over again as our extra reading for Shabbat Parah taught us today out of uh, Numbers 19. All of a sudden, what was unclean defiled the clean. Even the priest, when he'd take the ashes out, he was clean to start, but he'd be defiled for an evening just until the next day because he had to wash and cleanse his garments again because he got that soot on his life. I mean, sometimes when we're dealing with people, we get the soot of their soiled stains on our lives. And we have to wash ourselves. Sometimes I literally pray a prayer, Lord, don't let me take that problem home with me. Don't let me go. Let, Lord, I cast that care upon you. I'm not going to take that situation. You want to get the glory for that? I take no pride in what answer to prayer you bring because that was your answer, God. I gave your word. I did your service. They're your people. You touch them, Lord. And I walk away without that worry on my shoulders. I got to let it go because I'm going to bring it home to my wife and to my children. Or it's going to change my attitude in my household. Yeah, it's going to change it. And it said, because of the unclean, so that's not going to happen ever again. Now, look at what uh, Isaiah 59 tells us. Isaiah 59 says, in verse 16, speaking of God looking from heaven, it says, God, or Hashem, saw that there was no one. He was astonished that there was no one interceding. Do you know what God is still astonished? That nobody's praying. Mm -hmm. yeah. One nation under God. Where's the people mm -hmm. called by my name yeah. that will humble themselves and pray? Right. Why aren't we praying Amen. with the political problems we have in the world today? Why are we interceding with the anti-Semitism and, and, and violence, the Hamas that's in the world? Yeah, Hamas, violence is the Hebrew word, <laughs> literally. <laughs> that's right. And so it says here that God saw that there was no one interceding. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his righteousness upheld him. His own arm. Well, Isaiah 53 tells you that to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. It says he was wounded. For our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. How many know that's a picture of the Messiah? And specifically, we know his name. What's his name? Yeshua. Yeshua. So, really, the arm of the Lord here is Yeshua. It says the arm of the Lord is a person, because it says he put on righteousness as a breastplate. And as a helmet of salvation on his head, he clothed himself in robes of right of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Do you know that your zeal for God is something you wear? You can be so zealous for God, people see it all over you. You know, the clothes make the man. Zeal makes the man, too. The man of God, because the zeal of the Lord will perform it. So zeal is something you wear. Just like righteousness is something you wear. Look at Isaiah 61, speaking again of Messiah. The Ruach of Adonai, the spirit of Adonai Elohim, is on me. Because Adonai has anointed me. Who's he anointed? Me. The, now, this is Messiah speaking. But technically, if you're in Messiah, this is a verse that speaks to you also. Watch. It says, he has anointed me. Remember, the high priest was anointed once he was clean. Had fresh garments to put on. He anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison to those who are bound. That's the kind of stuff we need to be doing. To proclaim the year of Adonai's favor. That's a jubilee year. And the day of our, of our God's vengeance. To comfort all who mourn. We should come to the house of God comforting people that come in mourning. And when we realize that mourning is something that naturally comes because of death, and death brings defilement, and people were defiled by touching the dead, that we come in with such an anointing on our life that we actually comfort those who mourn. Now, what do we comfort them with? It says to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for what? Ashes. What did the priest take out? The ashes. Beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the oaks of what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Guess what the temple was made out of? Oak. Yeah. The trees of Lebanon. The oaks of Lebanon. That they might be called oaks of righteousness, meaning pillars in the house of God. That's what it means. It says, the planting of Adonai, that he may be glorified. I stopped there. The verse goes on. Uh, but I'm going to jump down to verse 10. Because he says, as... Uh, 
Chazan Mordechai gave us already. I will rejoice greatly in Adonai. My soul will be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of what? Salvation. Salvation. So we have here, Big Day Yeshua. He has wrapped me in a robe of righteousness. Sadaka. We have Sedekah. We have righteousness. And then we have here, like a bridegroom wearing a priestly what? Turban. 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 Like a bride adorning herself with her jewels. So on a wedding day, not only is the groom the king, he's also the high priest of the home now. And not only is she adorned like a queen, she is also a queen to be seen as a priestly intercessor. And it's, it's interesting that you and I are kings and priests unto God. So when you lift the, the bride, the groom up as king and queen on the throne, you see, you also realize that when they go back to their home, they're king in their world, but they're priests in their home. You see, you minister to your family while you rule as king over your world. Mm -hmm. And so king and uh, queen now become kings and priests unto God. Okay? So now, we take a look at uh, Isaiah 64, 4, because this is going to tell us how to take things off. Because I'm almost done here. Say he's almost done. Almost done. Look what Isaiah 64, 4 says. You meet him who rejoices in doing righteousness. What? Who does what? Righteousness. righteousness. Who remembers you in your ways. Behold, you were angry when we keep sitting all the time. Would we be saved? The question mark is. The question is. For all of us have become like one who is what? Unclean. What did defilement do? It made you unclean. You had to take off the old and put on the new when you're unclean. He says, and all of our righteousness is like a filthy garment. So you got to take off the old filthy garment before you can put on the beautiful garment. But the garment of praise, the garment of salvation, the garment that represents the beauty of holiness. Now watch this. Psalm 4, uh, 8, 4 says, the words of King David, it says, What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man, the son of Adam, that you visit him? Why do you keep visiting the descendants of Adam? He says, For you made him a little lower than the angels. In Hebrew, it's actually a little lower than Elohim. And you have crowned, literally encircled or surrounded him with glory and honor. What that means from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, he's covered in royal robes. Adam was a king priest as Melchizedek was a king priest, as you and I are king priests. Or a royal priesthood. Israel were king priests. A royal priesthood. The problem is they didn't step up to the level of their office. So what it says is, this is an office that Adam originally sat in. Now you know when you read the book of Hebrews, it tells you that not only was Adam given that, but he fell, and Yeshua had to become like Adam to be crowned with glory and honor. How interesting. Before the glory and honor, he received a crown of thorns. Yes. Because before the glory was the curse that had to be dealt with that was on Adam. And the thorns represent a curse. And so we see that here, the psalmist is telling us, originally, you and I were crowned with glory and honor. We can literally say encircled, surrounded, or clothed with royal robes of glory and honor covering us from the top of our head to the sole of our feet. What do you think is going to happen when we get our new bodies? Glorified bodies. We're going to have the same glory you saw on Yeshua in Matthew 17, the Mount of Transfiguration. We were going to glow like the light of the sun, literally illuminating through our garments. And the beautiful thing is, even when Adam and Eve were naked, they never saw each other's nakedness because all they saw is each other's glory. Yes. What if we can stop seeing each other's nakedness in the house of God? And we can start seeing each other's glory. What if we can stop arguing with our spouse and seeing their nakedness, seeing their sin, and start seeing their glory? Start looking at the good they do, the good yes. that God is doing in them and through them. Now, I close with this. Watch this. This is really one of the reasons why I said, get ready, get ready, get ready. You're going to find out what really the beauty of holiness is. Psalm 29.2 says... Be in awe before him, his majesty. Be in awe before such power and might. I love this, uh, the Passion Translation that says. It says, come worship wonderfully, a wonderful, it said, Yah, in the full name, hallelujah. <laughs> but I put Hashem, just out of respect. And so it says, come wor uh, worship wonderful Hashem, Adonai, arrayed in all of his splendor, Bowing in worship as he appears in all of his holy beauty. Now, this is why I chose this version, the Passion Translation, the New Translation. 
It says, give him the honor due his name. Worship him wearing the glory garments. Wearing the what? Glory the glory garments of your holy priestly calling. This is the reason why they translate it this way. This is the, uh, the idea of the same tr uh, words translated, the beauty of holiness. Mm -hmm. Amen. Worship in the beauty of holiness. It doesn't mean holiness in the at atmosphere. It means holiness that you're wearing because the word is referring to an adornment. And the word is hadar. Say hadar. 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 We have here hadrach kodesh. Hadrach kodesh. Holy adornments. This is a word connected to glory and honor, hod and hadar, or kavod, but it's referring to the adornments that are holy adornments that the priest would wear. That's why the translator said, of your holy priestly calling. What they're saying is, the moment the priest put on those garments, he was clothed in something that gave him a right to access the presence of God. Yeah. Don't you know you wear something that gives you the right to access the presence of God? Garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Garments that represent beauty in worshiping him because they're beautiful garments for beauty and splendor. The priestly garments that give you your calling as a high priest uh, wore his garments and a priesthood wore their garments. It represented an intercessing nation of priests that were praying to God without ceasing. Always knowing, even at your job and with your family reunions and with your gatherings and even in the marketplace and the hospital room, you're a priest unto God. Amen. I said, you're a priest unto Amen. God. You wear something that other people don't have. You're carrying something that other people can't carry. You have the ark of God's covenant presence on your life and on your shoulders. You are carrying something with a weight of glory on it. Amen. Oh, man, I close with this. Watch this. I love what Yeshua said in the NLT version. It reads this way. It says, be dressed for service. And keep your lamps burning. One thing the priest did when he was in his holy garments, he would make sure the lamps of the menorah were burning brightly and never burned out. Yeshua said, just like at a wedding, you're preparing for the groom to come. Just like you prepared for the priest to come. And the bells on his garments would let you know, the priest is coming, the priest is coming. Just like they said, the king is coming, the king is coming. Baruch Abba B'Shem alive. blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And when they would come, the bridesmaids, the women would be lined up with their lamps of oil burning. And the Bible says those lamps of oil burning are just like the lamps in the tabernacle. They have to be filled with oil. And it says you got to be dressed for service and have your lamps burning. How many are dressed for service and have oil in your lamps? Paul says this in Ephesians, Rav Shaul, he says in 4.20, However, do not, you did not learn Messiah in this way, if indeed you have heard him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Yeshua, with respect to your former lifestyle, you are to lay aside the old man corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in, in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Colossians 3, 8, he says to Colossae something similar. But now set aside all, uh, uh, set, us, set them all aside, anger, rage, malice, slander, foul language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another. After all, you have taken off, what have you taken off? The old self and its practices. And you have what? Put on the new self, the new man, the new image that is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. Are you glad that you are a new creation in Messiah Yeshua? You are a new creation. You represent the image of God, just like Adam with the glory of God on his life. When he sinned, he lost it. But when Messiah came, he regained it. He regained it. What am I saying about this message today as our, uh, our elder began to lead us in the concept of a holy place? And I began to teach you the steps of putting on holy garments. Today, we notice our number one point is, we must be dressed for what? Service. service. Fill that in. We must be dressed for service. Tiny space, write it all in, squeeze it in. We must be dressed for service with what? Holy garments. To enter the what? Holy place. We must be dressed for service with holy garments to enter the holy place. Once you're dressed for service, now you realize that you have access to the holy place. But what's the requirement before you do that? Number two, 
we must remove the rags of our filthy garments for robes of righteousness. We must remove the rags of our filthy garments for robes of righteousness. Are you willing to let the rags of the filth of your past go? I mean, like, stop holding on to it. Just let it go. Just let it complete. Just let it go. This is a new year. We should need to let it go. You can't get something new if you're holding on to the old. And then point number three. We must put off the old self of sinful practices to put on the new self that reflects God's image that is renewed through the Messiah. Are you glad today that you and I, no matter what we've been through, we can renew ourselves? Yes. Like the eagles. Yes. We can renew ourselves. You've been naked for a while? Put some clothes on. You've been dirty? Take those old clothes off. Kids, stand your feet today. Let's praise our God who washes us clean who robes us with righteousness, that puts new garments on us. Yeah. And today as our Hazan comes, yeah. we are thankful today that you and I, we get to wear our clothes that represent the priesthood of God. We today are dressed for service. Why? We've gone from rags to what? To righteousness. Stretch your hands for the blessing today. Did you receive this message today? Amen. Come on, stretch your hands for the blessing number 624 through 26. <laughs> Behishmerecha Yair Adonai Panavelecha Vichuneka Yisa Adonai shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his countenance towards you and establish peace for you. Through the Prince of Peace, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord today. Shabbat Shalom. Shavuot Have a good week. God bless you.